How do you like your games of rugby? Kickfest or Trifest? Well, we got one of each this weekend. Hello, amateurs, and welcome back to the Amateur Rugby Podcast. And I'm going to be with you here through to the end of the domestic season and beyond. So hit subscribe down below to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes. Now then, week 16 of the Premiership season. And as I said, we had a proper kick fest on Friday night with Bath versus Saracens. And then a real tri-fest, predictably, on the Saturday between Quinns and Northampton. And this brings up the question, the perennial question of different styles and games of rugby and whether, you know, an arm wrestle is entertaining or not, or whether, you know, a tri-fest can be too much like basketball with too many scores and defence not being a real factor. So do you like those kind of games? One, the other, somewhere in between, a bit of both. For me, there's a place for all of this in rugby. And it's the fact that we have all of these different styles that makes it so intriguing. If one team wants to arm wrestle and the other doesn't, can they stop them doing that? Can they get free of the arm wrestle and, and play the way they want to play? And likewise, if you want to arm wrestle, can you stop that other team, you know, really exploring uh, the width of the pitch like they probably want to? As I said, I'm a fan of both. I think the game is richer because we have all of these different styles. Now, a few years back when Harlequins won the league title, I was delighted because they were the one team that was showing real ambition, ambition to play, and everybody else was kind of playing the same, so there wasn't that variation. You know, the rugby was exciting, but that for me was secondary to the fact that we just had some variation in the tactics that were being employed. So, Important point there, variation in the tactics. So Friday night, Bath versus Saracens. There was a period, well, it happened throughout the game, but particularly in the first half where it was box kick, catch, rock, box kick, catch, rock. And the majority of the players were stood around on the pitch doing virtually nothing. Okay, so there's no variation in the tactics most of the players are not actually really involved in the game. And for me, you just knew what both teams were going to do during that phase of play. You knew that they were just trying to kick the ball down the other end and wait for a mistake. And that's where it gets boring for me. Kicking isn't boring. Boring kicking is boring. And to illustrate this point, there was a brilliant kick at the end of the first half when Farrell kicked for Sagan to score Saracen's second try and it was off the cuff and it was perfectly executed and it was a really thrilling piece of rugby. So, you know, for me, like I said, all these tactics are valid, but it's when one tactic becomes so strong and that's currently the box kick that you know what teams are going to do. That's when it becomes boring. And I'm so passionate about this that I'm going to be making a video about it next week. So keep your eyes open for that one. Okay. Let's go through the games themselves. And I've already touched on Bath versus Saracens. This was your stereotypical arm wrestle. I was wondering with Saracens because they played a decent amount of rugby recently and whether, you know, they haven't really flown, you know, in terms of the smoothness of their attack. So I'm wondering whether they didn't trust their attack on this or they just saw a weakness in the Bath wingers in particular in terms of turning and then kick returning. Because I don't think they're the best at that. Muir, Cock and a Singer, they're both really good ball carriers. They're not that great when you're turning and getting them to kick back to you. So I, th I think maybe it was a, a bit of both with Saris there. But Parton did score the opening try of the game uh, from a bit of ingenuity. A Farrell chip kick through the mir middle and uh, Parton ended up scoring over on the left-hand side. And I told you yellow card gave Bath a foothold in the game, but they were missing a lot of half chances here, Bath, in this game. In a game like this, when you're not going to get a lot, they had a five-meter line out, they went for a trick play, it didn't work. There was a ball back inside to Cock and a Singer that he really should have taken. And then just a lot of their other play, they were either overrunning the ball or the pass was slightly behind. They were off the money in this game, for sure. And I also thought Bath might have the uh, the edge in the scrum in this game, but actually Christian Judge went really well against Beno Urbano. I wouldn't say he won the scrum battle, but Saracen's scrum was rock solid. And this resulted in 12-0 at half time with the try that I described earlier, Farrell kicking for Shagan to score. Now, this is when the game changed. After half time, there was a period where neither team could win a line out, it seemed. And then the Bath subs started coming on. And it was 
here where Thomas de Toy started beating Riccioni in particular on that side of the scrum. That led to a line-out drive, a load more drives at the line. And Thomas de Toy, who just seems to find himself on that critical pick when the defence is weakest, and he bundled over for 5-12. Shortly afterwards, uh, a Jomo bumped Billy Vanapola, um, which is a rarity. You don't see Billy bumped off too, too often and maybe just another sign that he's he's just withering away in this Saracens team at the moment. Sad to see. However, that led to a Bath line-out drive and Cameron Redpath, fresh on the pitch, scored at the back of the back of the mall. I think he was as surprised as anybody and that made it 12-12. And at this period of the game, Bath were dominating. I mean, really dominating. The physicality of their bench was changing the game. They were managed to control possession and territory and they were just doing everything right. However, reserve fly half, Orlando Bailey then got an injury. Bath was 6-2 on the bench. This meant scrum half Schroeder went onto the wing. And I looked at this and immediately thought Farrell's, Farrell would have spotted that. Farrell did spot that, kicked straight to him. But Schroeder did a brilliant job, caught it, kicked on the turn. And then this was where the game changed. So Farrell retrieved the kick and beat uh, Matt Gallagher. And it was two Bath players running up. And Farrell managed to get on the edge of Gallagher and get round, which was key. Bath really needed to just hold their feet there and make sure Farrell had no escape whatsoever. That slight clink at the start allowed Farrell to offload. And then there was another offload and another offload. And then Theo Dan was away sprinting up the pitch down the middle. And these all these offloads and just changes of angle were just so beautifully done. And Dan kicked fought in Cameron Redpath to carry over, which gave them field position, eventually a penalty and a 15-12 lead. There's about three or four minutes to go. And I was thinking maybe in situations like this, sometimes scoring too early, sometimes you want to play through a few more phases if you can and almost eke it out right towards the end of the game before you get that winning score. But it wasn't to be. Muir did win the kickoff, but then it's turnover, turnover, turnover. Bath had a line out, which they lost. And that was the end of the game. I predicted Bath to take this in a tight one, but it was actually Saris who came out on top. Congratulations to them. On to the Saturday games, and Leicester did exactly what we thought they would do to Bristol, and that was squeeze them, dominate possession, stop them playing. And late in the game, Leicester 19 nil up, and it looked like Bristol, having scored 85 points last week, might be getting nilled. Uh, it's got to be said, really poor defence from Bristol for Leicester's second try scored by Oli Hassel Collins. It was essentially two two long flat passes from a set from a set piece, and Oli Hassel Collins went over into the corner untouched. Awful defence from Bristol. However, somehow Bristol got themselves back into the game. Uh, sub tight head prop Max Heath battered over, and then Mike Brown. I think this is really where the momentum changed because he had a dumb yellow card in the first half when he was on the ground and knocked the ball out of the scrum half's hand. And then when he was trying to stop Bristol playing from deep, he got caught upright, head-on-head -head collision, correct for a yellow card, and that was his second yellow. So red carded, although that made no difference in the, in the outcome of the game, really, because we're already into the last 10 minutes. And then another massive break where... Bristol again, this is not their DNA, but they're battering away at the Leicester uh, try line, something you'd expect Leicester to be able to deal with. And Lahif gets over for a second try. The inside tackle was so weak, he just fell off the tackle, which left Ollie, Ollie, Ollie Hassel Collins, who correctly tried to target the ball with nothing against Lahif, who also had somebody supporting him to get over. Back to within a score, and Bristol scored with the last play, conversion to win. And a remarkable victory, which does so much for Bristol's, well, continuing momentum and keeping them in fourth place and in, in line for a semi-final. I predicted by Tigers by two scores and for a long time, that looked like a decent prediction. But Bristol, wow, what a way to come back and win at Welford Road. Now then, Harlequins, Northampton. This was the rock and roll game. What an absolute thriller. The lead changed hands so many times that we lost count. 
Um, I'm not going to go through all of the incidents because there's far too many, which is, you know, just amazing in a game like this. And it's why we do love games like this. However, I want to pick out the slight home try because the commentator said Litchfield with a beautifully weighted kick. And I'm pretty sure it came somewhere like halfway off his shin. However, it did the job and slight home was over for a try. Luke Northmore back fit playing well. I've always loved Luke Northmore. I think his running lines, his intelligence and just his general I don't know, physicality and the way he moves is, is really excellent. Scored two tries, the second one from a really, really cracking line. However, he was at fault for the John Ram try in the second half. Just a really bad defensive read. And yeah, it was a bad defensive read, but pacing the game, threat at the line, stressing defenders. That's why people make bad reads because there's so much going on. That's where attack really thrives. They force North Northmore into a bad decision and Ram was over for the try. So great play by Saints, uh, exposing a weak defender there. Now then, the Danny Kerr incident. It needs to be addressed. Uh, firstly, yes, I, th- I personally thought it should have been a yellow card. Uh, cynical play from DC. Uh, on two counts, really. So that that's that done. You know, all refereeing is, decisions are subjective. So, I, you know, I'll always support the referee and what they decide to do. And also the referee's integrity should never, ever be questioned. Like it just, it's just a non-starter. Like there's no way of going anywhere with that if you start questioning the referee's integrity. So no time for any of that. Now then, should Carl Dixon be uh and be not be given Harlequins games. Carl Dixon, who of course played for Harlequins, him and Danny Kerr were teammates for a period of time. And you can say I can see this going two ways. I mean the answer yes, it would remove this what's happening at the moment, this massive pile on from people on social media, you know, saying it's a disgrace, saying he's biased and all this kind of stuff. It would remove that from being a possibility. But the other side is what if Harlequins made it to a final? You know, it's then detrimental to his career. If he happened to be the best referee in the game at the time and he's not able to referee a final, I don't think that's a good thing. And this is just Quinns, right? In this example, there's lots of ex-players that have become good referees. What if Andy Goode, for example, wanted to become a referee? He would be basically wouldn't be able to referee in the premiership. So I think it sets a bad precedent. If we, we're we saying that referees who played for a certain premiership club are then potentially biased, I don't like it at all. I uh, stand by the referee's integrity and I think they're doing the right thing. And getting through this, even though it might be a bit painful, I think is the right way to go. So I predicted Saints in a high scoring thriller and they did leave a few points out there, you know, potentially on the wrong end of a couple of refereeing decisions, which can happen. Uh, but Quinn's got this win and it's uh, that leads to a, a more exciting end to the season, I think, because this could be a premiership semi-final. And if results go right next weekend, it could be the European final as well. It could be the Champions Cup final. So that would be amazing wish both teams luck. It's going to be a tall order, but fingers crossed they can make it. Now then, a couple of the games which have less uh, or less likely to have any influence on the season. Gloucester versus Exeter. Chiefs basically just turned up and were more physical than Gloucester. They were more accurate as well, to be fair. Gloucester played a few like little loop plays and stuff and the pullback passes, they were just missing. They were missing by not even close as well. There were a few that just went straight to ground. So Gloucester you know, they weren't massively away from it, but it's enough in a game like this that they were they they were comfortably beaten. Jack Van Mullen, I'd like to pick out for Exeter, was brutal. Um, and he led their physicality of which they were dominant. Aside from, I would say, Freddie Clark in Gloucester's team really stood up, made some big tackles, just looked like he was always on it. It was a nice return to form for Henry Slade, who just found himself in so much space. Uh, his class shone through, along with his goal kicking as well. I think he was unbeaten uh, off the tee. Cairns, I thought, looked really sharp at scrum half um, on attack, but some a real dumb penalty at scrum, which let Gloucester back into the game uh, for Johnny May's try eventually. And he also got charged down a couple of times, which I'll come to when we talk about the second half. Clement scored from an Exeter lineup. Gloucester's Clement score from an extra line on the brink of half time, which get it was 10 24 at half time. And then with the game was nothing like that. Exeter should have been clear. 
Slade kicked everything. Atkinson kicked nothing as well. Uh, otherwise, it would have been closer. Now then, uh, interesting tactical thing for Exeter. They weren't taking tap penalties for a period of time. Five minute taps. They went for a line out from one from which Fayo Waboso eventually scored the bonus point try. They took a scrum from another one. That's not very chiefsy. They, they, they normally tap tap and go from all of those. So that was quite interesting. And uh, just as Rob Baxter was saying at 31.10, we're not clear yet. Arthur Clark, the huge Gloucester second row, charged down Cairns for the second time, galloped through and scored. And uh, it, was, it wasn't game on, but the scoreline was cl- way closer again than it should have been. Shortly after that, there was probably my favourite moment in the game where uh, it was a, uh, a rock where Cairns uh, was looking to box kick his way clear again. And I think it was Jamal Ford Robinson. You can hear it on the ref mic. I'm pretty sure it was him. And he just shouted out, he's coming again, little fella, uh, as Clark was there ready to charge down. I think he got a, a deflection on it, but didn't charge it. Fumula went over for the last try and it was 13.78 to Exeter. I decided, I suggested they have to win and I think they will. And that really was the difference because they were just much more up for this game. Final game of the weekend, Newcastle 10th and dead versus Sale in 6th and still a lot to play for. And I've only seen the highlights, but this looked like a really tight physical game, which I think Newcastle played a, a, a very decent part of. I think they had a lot of territory and possession for long periods, uh, but Sale were just more clinical and then eventually overpowered Newcastle. But it was 14 all halfway through the second half uh, before Sale came good. I said they'll be too good, but they'll make hard work of it. And that's kind of, it's kind of how it went. So that's week 16 in the books. Still six teams can make the semi-finals. Sorry, seven probably. Leicester, I think, are officially out now. They can't get to uh, the, the minimum total that will be achieved. Exeter down there in seventh um, will need a lot to go their way, I think to qualify and get a semi-final place. It's still possible, and they played well today in large portions, so it's still possible for them. But then sixth through second is really tight, really very tight. And uh, yeah, really could go anyway. Saints are still clear at the top, but it's closer now. They're still favourites to get a home semi-final. But it's an exciting end of the season. A week off premiership action next week as the European finals, uh, semi-finals, excuse me, are played out. And then we'll be back at it through to a premiership conclusion. I'm going to be with you for those semi-finals, the European stuff next week, by the way. So look out for that. But what did you think of this weekend's games? Which players did you think stood out that maybe I didn't mention? What were the key moments? You know, if you've got an opinion, a respectful opinion about the uh, the Danny Care Carl Dixon event, then I'd love to hear it down below. Do you agree with my thoughts on that? I'd love to know if you don't, you know, uh, it's all a good discussion, positive discussion. While you're down there in the comments, give this video a thumbs up. If you don't mind, it helps other people find it and you can subscribe there. You can watch that one next and do not forget to get out and play.